To listen to ad-free episodes and premium bonus content, visit sinspod.co slash apple to subscribe on the Apple Podcast app on your mobile device. Hey, listeners, we want to hear from you. Head over to our fan list page and send us your questions, leave us voicemail, or subscribe to ad-free and exclusive bonus content. Visit fanlist.com slash sins and survivors to connect with us today. The following episode discusses topics related to domestic violence, including detailed accounts and descriptions that some listeners might find distressing or triggering. Listener discretion is advised. In 2023, we take it for granted that we won't get convicted of a crime that we didn't commit because of how advanced forensic science is and because of the use of DNA analysis. Of course, that isn't true. And that's why it's so important that the Innocence Project exists. Before 1989, however, there was no hope of exoneration because of DNA evidence, and shoddy expert testimony sent many innocent people to prison without any hope of ever clearing their names. The very first person who was ever cleared through the use of DNA evidence was Gary Dotson, who served six years in prison for a rape he didn't commit. You might recognize the name Gary Dotson because he's the first husband of Camille Dardane's Dotson, who we discussed in detail in our previous two episodes. She disappeared several years after divorcing Gary and leaving the Chicago area to relocate to Las Vegas. And while he is in no way suspected in her disappearance, he was definitely abusive towards Camille and her daughter Ashley, and nothing we cover here is meant to excuse that. Over the next two episodes, we'll take a deep dive into his life, case, and history. And welcome to Sins and Survivors, a Las Vegas true crime podcast where we focus on cases that deal with domestic violence. I'm your host, Sean, and with me, as always, is the one and only John. I am the only John in the room. So, for the past two weeks, we've been covering the case of Camille Dardane's Dotson, who, as you recall, went missing from Las Vegas in 1994 and hasn't been seen since. Her daughter, Ashley, has been searching for years now with the help of the community, especially her friend Gabby. Ashley and Gabby are still working hard every day to find Camille and get the word out about her disappearance so they can have answers one day. And we really appreciate our listeners sharing the details of the case and supporting Camille's family on social media. As we researched this case, we learned about the story of one of the key people in Camille's life, Gary Dotson, who is also Ashley's father. Their turbulent relationship did not end well. It ended with Camille filing for divorce in 1989 and moving with Ashley to Las Vegas. Camille didn't have much in the way of job prospects here in Las Vegas, so she started tending bar. Unfortunately, she fell in with a bad crowd and progressed from bartending into sex work and then fell into drug use. Even more unfortunately, her second husband, Cruz Ruiz, was also abusive, as was the man she was with after that, a man named Kiko Fernandez. She disappeared in September of 1994, and we hope for her return. All of this happened to Camille long after she was separated from Gary. What we realized is that although Gary has a history of abuse against Camille, his story is an important one in the context of true crime and the pursuit of justice, so now it makes sense to cover his story. Gary was born on August 5th, 1957. He's 66 years old today in 2023. He was born in a suburb of Chicago called Country Club Hills, Illinois, and lived with his mother, Barbara, and three sisters, Laura, Debbie, and Gail, and his brother, John. Gary didn't finish high school and worked at a landscaping company. He also had frequent brushes with the law between 1971 and 1977 for things like truancy and even contributing to the sexual deviancy of a minor. In that case, a mother caught Gary in a parked car with her daughter and decided to press charges, but then withdrew the complaint the next day. In one story we read, he got caught in high school with a bottle of Southern Comfort, but of course he was adamant that he hadn't been drinking. However, it seems like alcohol became his drug of choice quite early in his life, and it remained a problem for him long into adulthood. I think it's safe to say one of, if not the single most important defining event of Gary's life occurred in 1977, When, at 20 years old, he was accused of rape by a 16-year-old named Kathleen Crowell, who he previously did not know and had never even met before. Kathleen 
Kathleen was born in Illinois in 1961, making her four years younger than Gary. Kathleen had it rough growing up. Her her mom had mental health and substance abuse issues, mostly alcohol abuse. Kathleen said that she was neglected by both her parents who were divorced. She had two brothers who were eight and 10 years older than she was, and her mother often had them take care of her. She recounted a story where because her brothers just didn't know how to take care of her, which isn't surprising because they were basically children themselves. Um, when she was like toddler age, they tied her to a trash can in a park rather than trying to like babysit her. Her father at one point got engaged to a new woman, but this girlfriend or fiance did not want children and was very nasty to Kathleen and her brothers. Eventually her father left her in the care of a woman who Kathleen called her aunt for an overnight. He called the next day and asked the woman to keep her for a few weeks. And then after a few weeks, he called and asked if she could take Kathleen permanently. Kathleen later commented that she went to stay for the night, but never ended up leaving. It wasn't really great for Kathleen there, however, either. This aunt had health problems, so she used Kathleen as her personal Cinderella, doing chores around the house. She was not allowed contact with her mother or her brothers. She wasn't really allowed to have hobbies or do sports, or go to friends' houses, and she even commented that she attempted to run away and even attempted suicide on occasion. Finally, and happily for Kathleen, the aunt sent her to live with the aunt's granddaughter and the, the daughter's husband. These are the people that Kathleen refers to as her foster family. Finally, Kathleen was allowed to have a childhood. Uh, she was doing well in school. She had many friends. She was taking honors classes and was really thriving. Kathleen even got a job at a Long John Silver's in a mall in Homewood, Chicago. On July 9th, 1977, Kathleen finished up working at the restaurant and left around 845 and headed across the parking lot to walk home. Kathleen's account of what happened is quite detailed. She recounted that as she was walking, a car with three men in it approached her, causing her to jump out of the way and fall. Two of the men then jumped out of the car and threw her in the back seat. One of the men got in the back seat with her, and according to her account, um, he tore her clothing and raped her, and after that, they attempted to carve letters into her stomach using a broken bottle. They then pushed her out of the car and threw her clothes out after her. Her account goes on to say that she got dressed and started walking home and came across a police cruiser, and the cop stopped to help. She recounted the nearly two-hour ordeal from around 8.45 p.m. to 10.45 p.m. to the officer. The officer brought her to the hospital, where she was examined and evidence was gathered. They discovered bruising and trauma in her groin area, as well as scratches on her stomach and swelling on her head. Kathleen worked with a sketch artist for a few days, and on July 15, 1977, she identified Gary Dotson as her attacker from a photo in a mug book, and then later picked him out of a lineup at the Homewood police station. Gary ended up losing his landscaping job, but between his arrest and the trial, he worked as a window washer and a night boarder at Burger King. Interestingly, no members of his family were very worried because they were all sure that Gary was innocent. It makes sense that no one close to him was very worried because Gary had a solid alibi for the night of the rape, which, remember, occurred between approximately 8.45 p.m. and 10.45 p.m. when Kathleen was picked up by the police officer. Gary was hanging out that night with several friends, eventually sleeping in the backseat of a car while his friends went to a party because he was tired. Later at the trial, four of his friends corroborated his alibi, importantly asserting that they were hanging out at one of their mother's houses until 9 p.m., and two others stated that they drove Gary home between 12 a.m. and 12.30 a.m. Gary was charged with rape and kidnapping, and the trial started two years later in 1979. The trial took place in Cook County, Illinois, and throughout the case, Kathleen was seen as credible. Her story was very detailed, and her injuries seemed to align with the story she was telling. One interesting fact was that in her composite sketch, she made no mention of a mustache, but per Gary's mother, Barbara, Gary had had a mustache since he was about 15 years old. Hi. 
Hi, it's Sean from Sins and Survivors, joined by the one and only John. I am the only John in this advertisement. Starting a podcast? Buzzsprout makes it simple. It's our choice for hosting Sins and Survivors, and here's why. Buzzsprout is user-friendly and perfect for beginners or pros. It offers essential features like easy integration with major platforms like Apple and Spotify podcasts, a customized web page, and insightful statistics to track your growth. What sets Buzzsprout apart? Advanced tools like Magic Mastering for audio quality, an AI assistant for social media and transcripts, and monetization options, including personalized ads. Start for free today. Visit sinspod.co slash buzzsprout to get your podcast live and share your story with the world. The prosecution had an expert witness named Timothy Dixon from the Illinois Training and Applications Laboratory who testified that the pubic hairs found in Kathleen's underwear were, quote, macroscopically similar, unquote, to Gary's hair and dissimilar to Kathleen's, suggesting a possible common origin. He also testified that according to his analysis, only one in ten men could have been the source of the semen found on Kathleen's underwear, and Gary Dodson was included in that. That assertion was later debunked, and it was proven that nearly two in three men could have been the source, so this was nowhere near conclusive in nature. As for the defense, they did not object to the transparently false testimony offered by Tim Dixon, and little was made about the mustache discrepancy. Apparently, per Illinois law, a discrepancy like that can be overlooked in an instance like this, however. Additionally, police never even produced the car in which Kathleen said she had been raped. Her description of the car didn't match any of the cars owned by Gary or the friends he was with that night. Um, And as previously mentioned from his alibi, it's quite solid. And I want to say here that none of Gary's friends or any other accomplices were identified or charged, even though Kathleen said that it was a group of three men who attacked her in the, at the end of the trial, Gary was found guilty and sentenced to two consecutive prison terms of 25 to 50 years. Here's where things really start getting complicated. In March of 1985, Kathleen comes out and completely recants her accusation against Gary. In fact, she says she was never raped at all, that she made it all up. And before I go into this part, I just want to remind everyone that Kathleen was 16 years old when she accused Gary of rape in 1977. So now she's 24 years old, and she's explaining to the press and to anyone who will listen that she had had sex with her boyfriend, David Byrne, and was terrified of being pregnant and being thrown out of her home. As we stated before, the foster family she was living with provided her a sense of stability. So fearing pregnancy, she concocted the story, tore her clothing, injured herself, cut herself with that glass bottle, and planned to walk home. She stated she never intended to go to the police or have the police involved at all. She planned to just lie to her foster parents, and it was just bad luck, I guess, that the police saw her walking home and saw how disheveled she was, and they stopped her. She stated that she, quote, didn't identify anyone because I didn't want to identify anyone. In my description of the attacker, I said he had blonde hair because the boy I had actually been with was blonde. I knew that they had taken pubic hair samples for evidence, and I thought, oh boy, he's got to have blonde hair. In my description, I was detailed because the more details you give, the harder it is to pick out a specific person. If you're general, almost anybody can fit the description, unquote. She kind of made the sketch up for the sketch artist as she went along. She didn't really think that they could find her attacker because he didn't exist. She's, she was caught up in, in her lie, and it just snowballed. When the police brought her a photo of Gary and said something to her like, look again, real close, she felt compelled to say it was him, and she hoped he had a good alibi. So the question you might be asking now is, how did a 16-year-old come up with a story that fooled basically everybody, the cops, the ER physician, the judge, everybody, and how did she come up with a story that was so convincing? Well, the answer is 
not only is Kathleen a very good storyteller and she's very convincing and come across comes across very credible, she didn't make up the story herself. She took a story from a romance novel called Sweet Savage Love, uh, written by Rosemary Rogers. In 1985, Kathleen admitted that she just used that story, the vivid rape scene from that novel, as the basis for her lie. Um, there's a lot of... It, if you were to read that scene from the novel, it just it's she just made it modern times. Instead of it being a carriage, she used a car as the location for the rape, but she just plagiarized it basically from this author. This was self-preservation for her. She knew her life was over if her lie was discovered. For the two years leading up to the trial, Kathleen said she suppressed her guilt. She's called herself manipulative and selfish. And despite knowing her actions were wrong, fear of consequences led her to maintain the lie during the trial. Her testimony was rehearsed with help from the prosecutor's office, and she was both scared and embarrassed on the witness stand and afraid that she'd be found out. After the trial, Kathleen said she tried to put the whole thing out of her mind, but couldn't forget how numb she had felt when the verdict was read, nor could she forget how Gary had cried. About a year after the trial ended... Kathleen began dating a guy named David Webb, who was a senior at her high school. After graduation, she went on to junior college, and then she and David Webb moved together to New Hampshire, and in July of 1981, they got married. There is an interesting fact about their wedding that I think demonstrates that Kathleen had good reason to be concerned about how her foster parents would have treated her if they found out she was having sex at age 16, especially if she was pregnant. When Kathleen got married to her husband, David, she was 20 years old. Her foster parents were invited, but did not come to the wedding because Kathleen had lived with David before getting married to him. As David and Kathleen built their new life in New Hampshire, the two of them joined a church and Kathleen became a born again Christian. And at some point she started having guilt and regrets about what had happened with Gary. She confessed to her pastor named Carl Nanini that the rape had not actually happened. He put her in touch with a lawyer named John McClario. She had been quoted as saying, All I can say is I created a monster of a lie, and now I'm trying to make it right. And, quote, His life is worth more than my keeping silent, unquote. McClario got in touch with the Cook County prosecutors, but they did not seem interested in her recantation of the rape accusation. After that, they reached out to the press. They contacted Jim Gibbons, who is a local on-air reporter, and he broke the story on March 22, 1985, the story of her recantation. The Chicago Sun-Times had a front-page article on the recantation, but the Chicago Tribune, which at the time was known to be more of a PR outlet for the Chicago Prosecutor's Office, the Cook County Prosecutor's Office, painted Kathleen in a very unfavorable light casting doubt on her recantation and characterizing her as unstable. And what followed is what I would call a smear campaign against Kathleen and the idea of her recantation. Kathleen's foster mother and father gave interviews to the Tribune, casting doubt on her explanations for her recantation by bringing up things like the timing of her menstrual cycle or the last time she had had sex with her then boyfriend. Um, Kathleen's boyfriend at the time of her accusation against Gary was a young man named David Byrne. Um, he stated that they'd had sex many times. So he was very skeptical of her claims about, you know, her being afraid because it was her first time. Um, her foster mother recounted that Kathleen got her period just three days after the rape. Uh, Kathleen and her mom, her foster mom were concerned that she could be pregnant from the rape. So when Kathleen told her, oh, I got my period, this was a big relief. Um, but, but that, happened before Kathleen went to the police and formally identified Gary. Her biological brother disputed several statements that she made about her childhood that she had given to People magazine. In the People magazine article, Kathleen wrote, she gave a very detailed timeline of when and where she was presented with photos of possible suspects, went to the police station to view a lineup, etc. And that did not match the police records, for example, Kathleen claimed she identified Gary from a photo that the police had brought to her home, but police officers and her foster mother said that the police never questioned Kathleen at the house. 
Kathleen claimed that her testimony went so smoothly because she had studied her statements from the police interviews and practiced with the help of the prosecutors, but her foster parents told the Chicago Tribune that Kathleen never did any of that. Uh, The Chicago Tribune published a claim from a, quote, source close to the investigation that called Kathleen unstable and calculating, this is a quote, and calculating evasive and manipulative, unquote. That source was later identified to be an assistant state's attorney who had been involved in the case. So it seems clear that the Tribune and the Cook County's prosecutor's office were probably concerned how they'd look if their star witness in Gary Dotson's case completely recanted her testimony. Yeah, it doesn't look good if they completely botched the case. So when Gary heard about Kathleen recanting her rape accusation, of course, he immediately requested a new trial. Instead, he was granted an evidentiary hearing and released on a $100,000 bond. The hearing was set for April 11th, 1985. At this point, Gary Dawson is obviously extremely excited. His accuser had recanted her accusation, and it seemed clear that to him that he'd be set free. So he started making plans for his post-prison life. He even made plans to organize a foundation to help cover fee, cover fees, quote, for all the innocent guys in prison, unquote. He made statements to the press that he would like to speak with Kathleen once everything was all over to find out why, quote, it's been so long. Why six years later? How could she hold it for so long? Unquote. So at the hearing, it was the same judge presiding that had presided over his trial, Judge Samuels. Judge Samuels determined that Kathleen's testimony at the trial was more credible than her testimony at the evidentiary hearing, and he ignored several key inconsistencies in her earlier testimony in the trial, including the fact that she said her pants got muddy during the attack, but also said she was raped inside the car. She said she was she scratched behind the attacker's ear, but no such injury existed on Dotson. She also claimed that her attacker was clean shaven, as we mentioned before, but Gary has had a mustache had had a mustache since he was fifteen years old. Because of all this, Samuels revoked the bond, and Gary was sent back to prison, reportedly slamming his hand on the table in frustration when he heard Samuel's decision. Remember that if the judge had simply ordered a new trial, there's little chance Gary would have been convicted because Kathleen wouldn't have testified against him. So in spite of Kathleen's insistence and her shameful admission that she had told such an egregious, ugly, detailed lie that landed an innocent man in jail, the question remained, both in the justice system and in the court of public opinion, did Gary actually do this? Was Gary a young, working-class guy that got massively unlucky? Or was he a violent rapist? Was Kathleen a scared virgin or an unstable perjurer? Was Kathleen lying in 1977, or was she lying now in 1985? And if she was lying now, what motive would she have for doing so? In our episodes on Camille, we mentioned how Camille had an obsession with Gary. Listening to everything that happened to him before he even met her explains why she was so taken with his story. And Camille always believed Gary was innocent, while her close friend commented that she didn't get why Camille ever gave a bum like Gary the time of day. Not everyone agreed with Judge Samuels. By that point, Gary Dotson was a household name, and many people were debating his guilt. Years later, Gary reflected on that April 11th hearing and how he had turned to alcohol to cope. Gary said that he, quote, had learned to live a different way for six years, and that drinking relaxed me, made me more open, made me more confident, unquote. He said that he had a six-pack for breakfast the morning of April 11th, the day of his evidentiary hearing. So this concludes part one of Gary's story. We'll pick it up next week with part two, where we'll explain how Gary did eventually leave prison and how his life didn't get much better after that. In the meantime, be sure to get caught up on parts one and two of Camille Dardane's Dotson story that we covered in episode six. Thanks, as always, for listening. And remember what happens here happens everywhere. Thanks for listening. 
Visit sinspod.co slash subscribe for exclusive bonus content and to listen ad-free. Remember to like and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and threads at Sins and Survivors. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave us a review on your podcast platform of choice. You can contact us at questions at sinsandsurvivors.com. If you or someone you know is affected by domestic violence or needs support, please reach out to local resources or the National Domestic Violence Hotline. A list of resources is available on our website, sinsandsurvivors.com. Sins and Survivors, a Las Vegas true crime podcast, is researched, written, and produced by your hosts, Sean and John. The information shared in this podcast is accurate at the time of recording. If you have questions, concerns, or corrections, please email us. Links to source material for this episode can be found on our website, sinsandsurvivors.com. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the podcast creators, hosts, and their guests. All individuals are innocent until proven guilty. This content does not constitute legal advice. Listeners are encouraged to consult with legal professionals for guidance.